Thank you for joining us. Um, my name is Carissa. I'm the National Field Director for the Movement for Black Lives. And we are here to talk about defunding the police, what we mean when we say defund the police, and how we plan to do it. Um, and so joining me today, we have leaders from the Movement for Black Lives, uh, a participant in our summer program, Freedom Summer. Um, and so it'll be a juicy presentation, and we want to make sure that we leave space and time for questions and answers. Uh, so I'm going to briefly go over kind of the history of the Movement for Black Lives and who we are, and then we'll jump in. Um, so the Movement for Black Lives was founded following the uprisings in Ferguson, uh, when folks, Black organizers um, and strategists across the country understood the need for a collective space for Black-led organizations to really be inside of this question, what is more possible um, when we are working in coordination and alignment, um, and what, what can we do together that is not possible for us to do apart? And so the Movement for Black Lives is made up of tactical tables um, that seek to achieve um, uh, the ability to set agendas for Black people and lead us to our North Star that is uh, partly drafted in the vision for Black Lives in addition to our broader North Star of Black liberation. Um, yeah, so excited to have you. And without further ado, uh, I'm going to kick it to one of our leads, uh, M. Adams, who's going to speak to our core programming um, that's laid out in our Black Power Rising vision. Hey, can everybody hear me fine? Great. So, hey, everybody, my name is M. Adams. I use any and all gender pronouns said respectfully, so it's appropriate to refer to me as she or her, he, he or him, they or them, all of those feel good and affirming to me. I'm co-executive director of Freedom Inc. and I'm also one of the leadership team members of the Movement for Black Lives. And so we are in an incredible time, um, as I'm sure all of you who are joining us understand that this moment is historic for a number of reasons. One, we are in still a 50 state rebellion. Two, we are amidst the novel coronavirus. And three, we are inside of what would be arguably maybe one of the most important elections of our um, lifetime. And so all those things have culminated together, as well as years and decades of grassroots uh, organizing work to produce um, an incredible opportunity. And so we want to talk to you about our Black Power Rising opportunity, which is, um, which we think is going to really help take our movements and our communities to the next level. So we engage in some rigorous, rigorous assessment. We think it's really important that you build plans that are based in assessment and not just sort of what feels good and what, what's popular and what people are doing. So we took some very serious time to develop a rigorous assessment. And in that assessment, we realized what we actually need to win or achieve in order to propel our communities, in order to get closer to um, the freedom dreams. So one, we needed to set agendas. We were no longer interested um, and just trying to gain influence or influencing people, but instead being able to set those agendas and determine them for ourselves. Two, we were going to build viable alternatives. Some of this shit is just not working for us. And so we as Black folks very much believe in our ability to self-government and build out what it is that we need to um, have our communities thrive. Three, we also were well aware of just the devastation that our communities experience, so we wanted to do harm mitigation. Four, Right, we are really trying to get to liberation or, or be on the path rather um, of the liberation work set out by our ancestors. And in order to do that, we needed to strengthen our power. And then five, we were going to fight white nationalism, right? And so this includes our work around defeating Trumpism. This includes our work that you see at the local level as well as the national level in resisting all different forms and aspects of white nationalism. And in order to do that, we developed a strategy. We de we've developed a project called Project 2024, our Black, Pro our Black Power Rising project, in which we have five pillars. One, mass engagement, right? We are interested in building a mass movement. We have a goal of directly being in contact and relationship with 10% of the Black population. So we want to be directly connected to 4 million Black folks. And with the incredible work that's happening, I think we're pretty, pretty close to that. Um, two, 
We want to advance local power, right? Absolutely, the national is important, but we know our lives are also shaped at the local level by local politics. And not just politics, but by, by the work that we're able to do person to person, human to human inside of our communities. And so we have a plan of advancing local power through deep, deep grassroots organizing that's going to bring about transformative campaigns that will win real improvements and changes in folks' lives. And when they talk about a uh, freedom summer, that'll you'll see an example of some of what that work looks like. Three, electoral justice. We are employing all means to get us closer to liberation. And so definitely being able to electoralize our issue, being able to codify our vision into policy, and then being able to electoralize it. And so we are working on ending disenfranchisement of our folks, as well as having people who are elected really be in alignment with our values and our politics. And we are no longer interested um, and trying to just convince and, inf and influence again, we're going for power. So definitely having the ability to hold folks accountable as well as get the folks who line up with us to, to do the work inside of those positions. Four, leadership development. The movement is made up of people. And so we need to be making sure that we're properly, not properly, that we are um, fully supporting our folks who are engaged in the work and providing adequate resources and training for people to fully actualize their potential inside of the movement building work. And so we have a goal of training up 10,000 black folks um, over uh, within project 2024. And so these would be folks who are trained on a number of things. Folks who are trained like in the Freedom Summer Project to do grassroots organizing work. We're also gonna be working with training up folks on how to do policy and, um, and how to do other skills that our movement needs because you know, our folks need skills, our movement needs skills, our communities need the skills. Last and certainly but, but not least, we are doing cross-sectoral movement building and we're doing multiracial solidarity work. So we are building a broad uh, united front through our work with the rising majority. And then we also have Ash on the call who can speak more to those efforts uh, when we pass it to Ash. But we are building out, right? We, we are here to win. And so we are building out um, a broad united front that, that seeks to align itself with our values, that seeks to align itself with our vision to move toward uh, liberation work together. And so that's really what we're trying to do, or that is what we're doing um, inside of Project 2024 Black Power Rising. And so I'll give an example of what that work has meant for us locally in my organization, Freedom Inc. So we're based in Madison, Wisconsin, and our the mission of our organization is to end violence within and against low-income Black and Southeast Asian communities. We define violence very broadly to include interpersonal violence, such as domestic violence and sexual violence, but we also look at systems violence, racism, capitalism, colonialism, et cetera. And we focus, on, we focus our work on women and girls, queer, trans, and intersex folks. And so in my background, you can see um, that I have some fierce freedom fighters behind me in my backdrop. Um, and that's part of our youth leadership team who was pivotal, who actually led um, some of our important campaign work. So we, like many other folks across the country, really began to develop a strong and a robust um, ending police violence abolitionist campaign um, around 2014, like many other people around the country, um, as part of the uprising that was happening. And as part of that work, our young people really began to define. And when I say young, I mean, the folks behind me are in middle school, right? And they've been with us for a few years. So we're talking about like elementary age, middle school, um, and high school folks. So our young folks were beginning to think about, well, what does this look like for me in my life, in my everyday life? And they answered the call of the movement of that time, which was go home and fight. Go home and figure out what this looks like for you, develop a campaign and win it. And that's exactly what they did. And so through rigorous analysis, these young folks behind me are being trained in gender justice. So really developing out a sharp feminist analysis. They're being framed in queer, they're being developed around queer justice. And so really understand what queer trans intersex liberation looks like. And also doing a lot of work to connect their struggle here with other black folks across the country and across the world. And so really having an anti-colonialism understanding and framework inside of that work. And as part of that and examining their own personal issues, they said, huh, we know what it is. We need to end the criminalization that happens to us inside of the education system. And the key step of that is removing police for, from schools. And for the last four years, these young folks behind us, so many of them came to us at like 10 years old. And now they're like 14, 15, you know, so they're still young. One of them in the picture is, is 13, so she came at like nine. And so those young folks uh, pictured behind me, young black girls who are survivors of violence, 
um, young black girls who said we had enough of this. And they worked really hard over the last four years to organize a campaign to remove police from schools. And, over the, and in the last few weeks, we finally won it. And just some highlights to point out inside of that campaign is one, we had an intersectional framework inside of that campaign. We knew we were young, working with young survivors, right? And so we knew that there was a myriad of issues that we had to address. Violence inside of their home, violence inside of their communities, um, violence in some of the relationships they were inside of as well as uh, directly addressing systems violence and state violence. So also removing police from school. And so as part of that campaign, not only do we demand that police be uh, removed from schools, but we also built up transformative models inside of communities where these young people could begin to practice how to end harm inside of their lives as baby abolitionists, as young um, abolitionists. And the last thing um, that I'll point to that's also important inside of this campaign that ties to defund is there were three demands in that campaign broadly. One was to remove the police, which meant directly ending the contract and shifting those resources um, back, to the, back to the community or back to the school. Two, it was around investment, right? And so defund, so much of defund is about tearing down the thing, defunding the thing you don't want, but investment back. Two, investing in leadership, wellness, creativity of black students. And then three, it was around community control. We were fighting for power, the ability for black folks, for black students, black families, and black communities to actually determine what our education systems look like. And so, yeah, so boom. So we fought that campaign, we won it, we still can't believe it, um, but we're still fighting. We're still fighting to um, fully defund uh, the police and, and further build up the infrastructure we need it. Really beautiful. Thank you, Em. I'm really inspired by the folks uh, inside of your organization who, who have been real models for what it means to not only think about um, how we're moving um, these catchy phrases that folks are screaming in protest into actual wins, um, as well as the, really inspired by the commitment to leadership development for your folks. Um, and so as M named, part of our Local Power Project, which seeks to build local power in a numeric number of cities across the country over the next five years, um, one of our first steps of engagement is Freedom Summer. Um, and so folks know the historical Freedom Summer from 1964, which was um, rooted in um, really, uh, um, uh, you know, making interventions around Black folks' access to polls and ballots and voting. And so, although we know that the conditions uh, present today are not the exact conditions present in 1964, uh, we're, we're excited about um, uh, the, the connections that we're able to build. And so, through Freedom Summer, we have 202 fellows across eight locations. Uh, working with 11 different organizations, and they're all engaging in some form of campaign to weaken the carceral state. So included in that are um, uh, our folks in Miami are following the lead of um, Freedom Inc. and others who have gotten police out of schools. Um, our folks in Detroit are working to dismantle a hyper surveillance program that targets black people. Our folks in Dallas are working to defund the Dallas Police Department. And we're very excited to have one of our fellows on who is from uh, um, the Atlanta team to speak a little bit about her experience uh, during Freedom Summer in Atlanta. So Jasmine, you wanna jump in? Hi y'all, can everyone hear me? So, um, Freedom Summer from me down here in Atlanta, we are working to defund APD by $73 million. Um, we're asking that they put that uh, community trust fund so we can figure out how to um, We're doing grassroots organizing. Uh, we're out here hitting the pavement, um, getting petition signatures for the um, for the for the defund defund bill that we have proposed, um, we're we're having town halls, we're having marches, we're also telling people to get out and vote. We're giving them education on how to vote, um, as far as researching your candidates and knowing what seats um, are up for vote and how they affect 
us in the community. Um, so far it's been, I love it. I, I, I love this work that I'm doing. Um, and it does remind me of 1964 of how, um, we, when we say defund people out here, they, they look crazy and we have to break it down to them and, and get them used to the ideal. And it reminds me of um, back in 1964, the Freedom Summer, when, when black people were scared, you know, to, to go register to vote. Um, so we're, I have to tell them then that was a radical view back then. So defund is radical now, but it doesn't mean that it's wrong. Um, so yeah. That's my experience here with Freedom Summer 2020 in Atlanta. Thank you for sharing that, Jasmine. It's really inspiring to hear what y'all are up to, and we are excited to continue to support your development over the next couple of weeks. Uh, Freedom Summer concludes uh, at the end of this month. Um, and so I'm going to kick it to our comrade Nat uh, uh, Network, who's going to tell us about the app for Black Lives. Uh, one of the tables that we um, hold is the mass engagement table. And that space is really thinking about how are we making mass interventions using communications, technology, culture, and action. Um, and so without any further ado, go ahead, Nat. Hey, peace, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us. Um, so today I'm going to just talk a little bit through uh, the app for all black lives. Um, the app for all black lives is visionary um, organizing in practice. It came out of this building of the um, Black Power Rising 2024 strategy where we identify gaps in our movement infrastructure, limitations to the impact that we can have. And we also acknowledge that young people who'd been activated and were um, surfacing online were more digitally connected and politically woke since Ferguson than at any other point in our history. So we decided to look at these online interactions and the fact that we're building an increasingly unsafe, infiltrated and surveilled technology spaces that put our people and our communities and organizing and activists at risk. So we wanted to um, create something that was an integrated technology tool that advances our strategy, helps to support fellows who are doing work in say Freedom Summer, um, support the local organizations, which are you know, over 150 across the US in developing campaigns and strategies for defunding the police, as well as investing um, in our own communities and building alternatives. So our app, I'm just going to um, share my screen. Okay, thank you, Hush. And I just want to show you um, what we have. We're at the moment, we're in a testing phase where we've been testing this um, out on the streets with our youth. Um, we've had some amazing people uh, connect into this and help us to build the vision because what we wanted to do is not just be repeating the patterns in Silicon Valley of creating technology that didn't speak for us and wasn't by us. So obviously this is on my computer, but if it's on your um, phone, you'll see it as an app. So it, it's a way for us to be able to look at how to defund the police, how to join um, our campaign and how to build your own campaign. Um, so as I said, this is an integrated tool where there will be different activities and different tasks that you can do. And as you're doing this, you will be building up points that you'll be able to um, get access to different things um, like time with organizers, being able to do some trainings, being able to access resources to, to strengthen your campaigns, as well as actually a tool for the campaign itself. So you can do things like TikTok challenges, emailing your mayor, tweeting out. This is just, as I say, a test at the stage and we're gonna be having so many more activities. Inside here, we're giving you um, copy that you can uh, just drop into your uh, TikTok and then you can drop your TikTok URL to us. And so then we can also amplify the things that you are doing. Um, so 
So you can also, we've given you ways to email your mayor, you can find a local representative, you will be able to uh, copy different texts and then tailor it to meet the needs of your uh, local um, department. And then you can, again, move past and show us this and, and be able to connect with us. We've also given in this app space in order to do some political education. Um, so you can, we've got some talking points on how you can defund the police, build your own campaign. Um, you can add to this here with us and you'll be able to tell us how to speak truth to power, what it means and why you think now is the time to defund police. You'll be able to, again, take talking points and work through it with your family and people who you're sat down and having dinner with just being able to talk about what you need to do to build an organizing tribe and how you do this in a way that has impact and putting that into action so then we will we also have in the app a whole range of different actions that you can take with different levels of risk because we acknowledge that not all people can be in all places and so in here you will find a variety of different tactics that you can use um, with uh, tools, um, downloads, things that you can use. Um, so this app in itself will be a one-stop shop really that you can use it to build a campaign, to take action, to, to defund the police. And also it's really important, as we say, that, that any technology we're building, that we are keeping ourselves safe and that we're here to help you and support you in keeping safe as you build campaigns. So here you can go into this section you can look at infiltration, you can look at different ways to protect each other with COVID-19 and the pandemic, as well as with the state. And you can then look at misinformation. You can download these um, and they also take you to uh, resources. So one more thing that we're doing um, is we have on our website, uh, m4bl.org, uh, a defund the police campaign. On here, you can go to this as well before the apps launch in order to look at the values and visions, what we mean when we say defund the police, different talking points that you can use, tough Q and A's that you can have with your comrades, with other people in your community about defunding the police. And then you can see some of the stuff that's happened in, in the press. So this is just some of the ways that we're using digital spaces in order to develop political education and action to drive change in our communities and keep us safe. Shout out to you network. Um, the, the vision around the app is just, just phenomenal. Who would have thought we would have had an app teaching people how to organize? It's juicy, 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 juicy. Um, and so I see the questions are starting to populate in our questions and answers. Um, as I named, we will have time for questions and answers at the end of the call, so please stick with us. Um, but I want to move to um, my comrade, Kayla Reed. Um, Kayla is going to speak a little bit about the Black National Convention. Hopefully, y'all have already seen um, some stuff that's been percolating around the Black National Convention, um, and hopefully she'll be able to fit in something around her local work um, to close a jail in St. Louis. Thank you for that plug, uh, Carissa. And hi, Netroots Nation. Uh, thank you all for having InfoBL on. Thank you to the 155 of you who chose to come in here um, to learn more about the Movement for Black Lives. My name is Kayla Reed. Uh, I am the executive director of Action St. Louis, which is a base building grassroots organization in St. Louis that was founded after the Ferguson uprising. Um, I am also one of the lead organizers on the Electoral Justice Project, which is a pillar and table of the movement for Black Lives. Um, and I serve in that role with uh, Rakia Lumumba and Jessica Bird um, leading that table. So let's get into the Black National Convention. We've all known now for the last four years that this year was coming and we are about 80 days out from one of the most important, significant, impactful elections um, of our lifetime. Um, and we hear that every four years and both are very true. 
that this election is uniquely different because we understand that the material conditions of our folks are literally, uh, people are dying, folks are being evicted, people are starving, they are not working, um, and we have an unabashed racist white nationalist in the White House who has used uh, the power of his pen and office to um, break systems and, and create more harmful uh, policies for our folks. Um, and what that means is that our people are gonna mobilize to the polls in November, like we've never seen before, even in a pandemic. However, our votes, our communities, our voices, our demands cannot and should not and will not be taken for granted uh, by the Democratic Party simply because the opposition is the literal devil. Um, and so for us at the Electoral Justice Project, we spent the better part of three years really interrogating what does it mean to build real Black political power? How do we, as M said, electoralize these issues and ground them in a radical vision for transformation for our communities? And how do we um, make sure that Black communities have what they need um, outside of just you know, participating in a, of a system that inherently hasn't always and continues to not uh, lift up our vision for a transformation? I want to talk a little bit more about EJP before I get into the Black National Convention. So you can just scroll back up to the pretty picture. Uh, the Electoral Justice Project um, does a few things. We understand that we, we call it the Electoral Justice Project because our electoral systems are deeply racialized. Our folks are disenfranchised. Our power is diminished. Uh, we do not believe in a two-party system. It has infringed upon our ability to build true political power for our communities, but we understand the realities in which we organize, and so we are going to build power right now so that what tomorrow looks like is better for our, uh, for our communities. Um, we seek to dismantle broken systems while building the infrastructures of our organizations. Um, what we know about the electoral systems and Black communities is that all of the funding, all of the resources, all of the capacity comes in um, a few weeks out from the election and then it all dissipates, it all collapses. And the Electoral Justice Project understands in order for us to build long-term power, we must continually invest so that our organizations are growing. Um, I will use St. Louis as an example uh, for August 4th. EJP has been a partner to Action St. Louis and many organizations um, like Action St. Louis throughout the country. And one of the things that we've invested in and are trying in St. Louis is what does it mean to have a strong organization that electoralizes the issues and builds a base to actually win things on the ballot that connect to the issues that we need. For example, we've had a campaign for the last two years to close a jail in St. Louis known as the Workhouse. We successfully passed an initiative, an ordinance that will close the workhouse and take that $16 million, uh, create a division for supportive reentry, and then reinvest the remaining millions into a re-envisioning public safety fund where communities that are most impacted by violence are able to take those resources and invest them into solutions that they feel like will help. Um, and that issue is not on the ballot, but certainly the people who passed that ordinance are. And so in 2019, we ran an aggressive campaign to turn out the vote for the electoral uh, municipal elections here, uh, making close the workhouse a key issue. Um, it, it became one of the most important issues of the election. It was a deciding factor on whether or not a candidate was actually progressive or not. Um, and then once we were done with the elections, we started to work on ensuring that this policy was introduced. One of the key reasons that this policy was able to be successful is because in 2016, we elected a reform, um, a reform minded prosecutor into the city of St. Louis circuit attorney position, and she was up for reelection. Um, and the police union, conservative and moderate white establishments all mounted a very strong, well funded public campaign to uh, unseat her. Uh, we were able to launch uh, again a field program to not only support her, but support a statewide ballot initiative. And in one day we made, we kept her in her seat and we passed Medicaid expansion. There was no other organization in the state that knocked more doors than Action St. Louis. There was no organization in the state um, that had more conversations about Kim Gardner or Medicaid expansion than Action St. Louis. And that is because we deeply believe that in between elections, we must continue to build power so that our messages are legitimized, our brand is trusted, and that people understand that we're not gonna go away. 
that's why electoral justice is really important to the movement for Black Lives, because where there are strong organizations, there is a reality to grab power. And as we head into 2020, our demands must be electoralized, and we must hold those accountable who ask for our votes. And so we are going to set an agenda for our own lives. And that is why we are announcing and launching and working toward the August 28th event, the Black National Convention. What is the Black National Convention? It is a space where we will convene Black people to talk about the issues that we want to see prioritized with the next administration, to talk about the significance of down ballot issues, and to, to realize and make known that Black voters will play a pivotal role in determining whether we have four more years of domination or a new administration. We were inspired by previous conventions like the 1972 Black National Convention, the 1998 uh, Black Radical, um, the Black Radical Conference, where we, we've seen Black people come into a room to establish an agenda for Black lives. And we are very excited about this conversation. We've already had a pre-Black National Convention where we convened 700 organizers across 22 states. Each of, we had hosts where each of them built out a 20 to 25 delegate pool from their entire state and are building a down ballot uh, strategy and also working in conjunction so that we win in November. We are seeing the formation of statewide Black coalitions in defense of Black lives that are going to not only push for things like defunding the police and closing jails, uh, expanded voting rights and housing, but electoralize them and strategize with our people centered in the conversation. The Black National Convention is something that everyone can watch. It happens August 28th at 7 p.m. I am one of the hosts, along with uh, Phil Agnew and Angelica Ross. Um, you will find the Black National Convention at blacknovember.org. If you go there now, you can sign up for updates. We will email you, we will text you, and then we will mobilize you to action so that we can make sure that our folks have the best chance of uh, changing the conditions on which we organize so that we can build power long term. Uh, I hope that you go to blacknovember.org on your next break, that you sign up for updates, and that you join the movement for Black Lives as we decide that on our agenda, and then we win all up and down the ballot in November. Thanks. So, so, so good. You know, my, my Midwest comrades have been telling me that the Midwest got something to say. I think it's imperative that we all start to listen because they just went in so much out there. They went in so much. The other thing that I really love is I was uh, had, had an opportunity to hear Kayla speak. Um, and one of the things that Kayla said is, I'm not an electoral organizer. I'm an organizer who knows how to use an electoral strategy. And I think just that orientation um, felt really grounding for me in terms of how we understand the work that we're up to together. Um, and so, uh, as y'all know, we um, are not only thinking about electoral strategy in terms of the work that we're moving and the folks, you know, the, the issues that we're supporting, but we're also into the uh, real righteous work of creation. And so I want to kick it to my comrade, Ash who's going to take us through um, the BREATHE Act, which is model legislation that was born out of the movement for Black Lives. Thank you, Carissa. And shout, I mean, y'all mighty quiet in the chat for the, for the heard so many good words from so many brilliant people. Um, so if you, if we hadn't already told you enough to be excited about the work of the movement for Black Lives, can you just let me know in the chat if you felt moved by the incredible work that Kayla Reed just shared, if you feel inspired by Jasmine and M. Adams, if you feel ready to be organized and directed by Carissa Lewis, can you just shout out that you are here and present and paying attention to this life-saving work that the Movement for Black Lives is making possible? I just wanna say for posterity that when we first started meeting in December of 2014, that one of the things that we said we wanted to come together to do was to figure out what are the impossible things that we could do together, that we could make possible, that would be continuously impossible if we worked in silos away from each other, both as organizations and as individuals, and look what has become possible, right? People didn't say, people literally were saying out loud that the movement for Black Lives would not survive the winter of 2014. And look at us now. Network just showed you this incredible app that you should be foaming at the mouth to get. 
right? Carissa has told you that we are 150 organizations strong and growing by the second. M. Adams and, 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 and Kayla have told you about concrete work and Jasmine about concrete work on the ground from the Midwest and the South, the most under-resourced under geographic regions in our country, where arguably the highest concentration of Black people live, right? You should be inspired and moved to do something. And that's not even all the work, right? There's still even more that we're gonna be presenting on right now. So I just wanted to make sure I was still in the right space, that Net Roots Nation were folks that were alive and ready to be moved to action uh, under the leadership of Black people. So if that's, if that's why you came to this workshop, then I might be in the right place. If not, I just was trying to check. Uh, so if you're in, if you're still with us, I just want to make sure that I see you in the chat uh, throughout these incredible presentations. So now I'm gonna get, I'm gonna get back to what Car Carissa told me to talk about. So I'm also a person who proudly, well, let me introduce myself. My name is Ashley Woodard Henderson. My homies call me Ash. Uh, I use any of the pronouns, but she and her is where I call home. Um, and I am the first Black woman co-executive director of a place called the Highlander Research and Education Center in Tennessee. Um, I'm a proud Southerner and uh, an even prouder member of the leadership team of the Movement for Black Lives. Uh, in that capacity, I've been able to serve for the last like six, seven years um, as a member of the leadership team of the policy table of the Movement for Black Lives and was one of the folks amongst many, many, many other folks, including some of you who are actually in the chat, uh, uh, that wrote the, the Vision for Black Lives. Um, I'm excited to tell you, if you haven't already seen, that the Vision for Black Lives 2.0, the second and updated edition, uh, is now currently being launched. You can see the In the War on Black People section um, and all of the briefs that are included in that uh, on our website, infrabl.org. Um, you just click the policy section and, and you'll be able to see the vision. You'll be able to see uh, the, both the old version and the 2.0 version as it's released, you can see the in the war section right there. And you can see all the other policy demands that we've put out, whether it was around protection of protesters uh, to push against uh, the criminalization of dissent um, and the demands that we put out in regards to making sure that our people are taken care of and protected during this global pandemic. So that if that wasn't enough to be done in regards to policy in tandem with this multi-tactical strategy that you've heard my comrades speak about, right? Electoralizing, organizing, um, politicizing our folks, doing political education and leadership development that Chris is, and so many other incredible organizers, political educators, popular educators, and leadership development trainers have been, been holding. Uh, we also saw in the wake of the murder of George Floyd and Tony McCade and Breonna Taylor, and Natasha McKenna, um, and Ayanna Stanley Jones and Elijah McClain, um, Kayla Moore, Freddie Gray, Atiana Jefferson, Oscar Grant, and so many other deaths of our, of our Black siblings, uh, that it was time that we were getting a mandate from the street to make clear to the federal government what we wanted beyond just the policy demands. We knew that it was time for us to come together to pull our resources, our talents, our brilliance, and develop our own federal policy that we could write our own bill. And so we've done that. We've done that in the honor of the lives of those that have been stolen from us by police and state sanctioned violence, uh, both this year and over the generations. So what's the Breathe Act, Ashley? Well, I'm glad you asked. It's a visionary bill that divests our taxpayer dollars from brutal and discriminatory policing and invest it in a new vision of public safety. When we say defund the police, we are declaring that there will be a reimagined public safety in our communities that takes resources from failed systems that were never designed to keep us safe or to keep our communities at peace and to reinvest those dollars into the community-led solutions that we've always deserved that, that decrease harm from happening in the first place. One that responds to the street mandate to defund the police and allows our communities to live in their fullest dignity. So you can go to the website, breatheact.org, and you can read the, and download the summary of our bill. It's really just four sections of work that if and when is passed uh, on the municipal, state, and federal level uh, will totally dismantle the criminal legal system as we know it uh, and the ways that it has been harmful to communities and reinvest and repair the harms that have been created. So the first section is really to dive into divesting federal resources 
from incarceration and policing and in criminal legal system harm. So it will stop the harms, it will pull the resources. The second section is around then taking those dollars and investing them in new approaches to community safety, utilizing funding initiatives. So if you dismantle and you defund, you are then reinvested in with incentives that allow you to continue to implement the alternatives that will actually be the things that serve our communities in the first place. The third section is around allocating new money to build healthy and sustainable and equitable communities for all people. So not just figuring out how to take dollar for dollar, divest to invest, but also how do we create new revenue generating opportunities for communities who are implementing these new alternatives and reimagining safety. And then section four is an opportunity for us to hold officials accountable to our policy demands, making sure that they are implementing what communities know to be actual solutions and not false solutions, and enhancing the self-determination of Black communities, helping us to continue to build and develop alternatives to reimagine safety and to govern ourselves. So if you want to be in the streets, we want you to do that. If you wanna be an organizer and a base builder, we need you too. And for those of you that are about developing and advocating for progressive policies, we need all of you to support the Breathe Act. So our request is for you to go to breatheact.org and sign up for more information and to be a community co-sponsor of our bill. We know that it's gonna require action from Congress, but we also know that it's gonna take a grassroots movement like we've never seen to develop the 21st century civil rights bill of our generation. This is our moment. Uh, this window of opportunity for us to be able to pass progressive policies that change, actually change the material conditions of black people from the ground up is our opportunity right now. And so many of us, thousands, tens of thousands of us have now signed on to this bill and are pushing it from the local to the federal level. And we want you to join us. With that, I will toss it back over to Carissa. Woo, you know, you could always count on Ash to do an altar call, to bring some of that pastor energy into the conversation. I hope you were seeing them uh, comments light up as you was moving through um, uh, your, your request for folks to engage in the conversation. Um, and so really just want to stop here and create space for us to be in conversation together for a few minutes and then want to want to kick it to um, answering some of these questions that are that are populating. And so again, it's hard for us to track if you're putting questions in the chat. So if you could please direct all of your questions to the question and answer. Um, box, we'll be able to navigate those more easily. So this question is for anybody um, and, and, and all of us. Um, why is this moment different? What makes this uh, moment, we see you. This, this, this iteration uh, of the Black liberation struggle um, different? What's, where, are there nuances here? Yeah, um, I think so. Uh, we, so we heard our brilliant sister on another call, Makani, um, out of Jackson, Mississippi, talk about this moment as a rupture. Uh, and I thought it was a, a, a perfect description of the ways in which the layers have been building for this moment. Um, the long history of uh, the abuses and violence and death um, of white supremacy, the recent history of uprisings um, and resistance that we see happening in places like St. Louis, Baltimore, um, and the conditions of this moment, including uh, a pandemic that is killing our folks, that is breaking down our economy, that is sacrificing folks unnecessarily, and an administration that refuses to acknowledge the harm or do anything about it, that all of those things um, were opened up and, and poured out into the streets uh, with a vision, with, with in addition to the deaths of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and so many others, Elijah, you know, just so many names over the past six years and even this year alone. And I think when you start to understand the conditions, what people have been resisting, the violence that they've seen, the harm, um, it opened up, uh, it opened that up and people poured into the streets and people understand because they've seen resistance over the last uh, decade, you know, really 
that this is, this is part one of a long fight that we must commit to, we must stay committed to. Um, and I actually, and I also think that part of what also ruptured, uh, what has also grown and expanded is the capacity of our movements. We've grown, y'all. We've learned. We've gotten better. We've gotten sharper. We are winning. So we understood as leaders in our own community, as people in our own organizations, that we could never fully hold this moment, but that we, we understood how to strategically respond in this moment. I think about on a personal level how much investment M4BL has done for me since Ferguson to now. And just the ability to have the analysis to, to reckon with what a rupture means, to contextualize this moment broadly. Um, but all of those things are, we can't isolate one singular thing uh, in order to, to, to realize how we got here, that all of those things are interlocking and creating this condition, this, this period of conditions in which our folks are responding to and willing to respond to consistently, even in the face of extreme brutality and violence and threat. Um, they are still showing up and that we are now moving on all fronts in ways that we haven't before. Yeah, I totally agree with Kayla. I think that like the other things that I would add is that white nationalist supremacists and paramilitary forces are organizing, right? Like they are, they are building power, they are building organization. Um, and it's our turn to do our due diligence to fight for resources to make sure that black people have political homes and are working together across our sectoral differences to build the united front of black freedom fighters of a 21st century context that are, are here to win. And I think, um, you know, the last thing that I would add that I think that some of our elders in particular have really been keeping on the forefront of our thinking and, and brilliant, brilliant theorists like, like my comrade Emma Adams have been continuing to remind us is like, the fascists are very clear about their playbook, right? I think about a Jairus Dixon uh, who literally wrote about it, right? Said that what these folks are doing is using the, these emergencies to restrict civil liberties, to suspend government institutions, to consolidate their power and their wealth, uh, that they reduce checks and balances and, and access to elections and offer uh, offer forms that are not like participatory governance as the solution to these things and on and on and on. So like, I think that yes, we've been living in a neoliberal state and that that is bad for black people. But I also think that we've been seeing like a turn towards more and more and more authoritarianism and more fascism and the movement for black lives has been consistently calling that and saying that that is not normal, nor should it be the norm and doing everything in our power to not only fight back against the systems that we need to tear down, but to encourage black communities, grassroots communities and resource grassroots black communities to be able to develop the alternatives for themselves, right? To implement solutions from the ground up. And so, you know, again, I think that's why so many of us in our individual organizations are proud to work together and build this family that is the movement for black lives, because it actually shouldn't have required this much cumulative black death due to COVID, due to police uh, violence and state violence, due to economic crisis, et cetera. Uh, but because there's been so much, like Kayla said, there's been so much happening uh, that we've been able to build a movement that's really rooted in trust and relationship and doing the work and assessing that work and figuring out what we can do next. And if I could add three quick things to that. Yes, please. Okay, so one, I think something that's really important in, in this iteration of movement within like Movement for Black Lives is that issues that were on the periphery of popular Black movements are now central, or at least we're trying to make them central. So for example, inside of this movement where we've identified police violence as an issue, then the broader prison industrial complex, then the state, we have since also expanded it to think about anti-blackness, white supremacy, and also patriarchal violence. And so what, I'm, what that means for us is in this movement, unlike some of the former movements, is not only are we rigorously fighting to defeat police violence, we are also just as committed and just as serious in, 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 in seeking to end interpersonal harm, such as rape, gun violence, and some of these other issues that often are on the periphery of like these bigger, more popular things. And I think that that's important. That means that this movement is more comprehensive. And that means we have an opportunity to have more folks inside of these movements. And that's evidenced by who you see in leadership, right? So because we're taking all the issues of Black people seriously, 
you see women in leadership. You see queer, trans, intersex folks in leadership. You see disabled people, immigrant folks, formerly incarcerated, et cetera, um, marginalized Black people in leadership and with the politic, right? And so I think that's part of what is different now um, versus other times. And because of that, I think there's just two other quick, quick things. One is that um, the concept of defund is popular now. Right, so if you look at the, re the, the rebellion um, of 2014, 2015, many people were engaged and many people were thinking about, you know, what's the issue with policing, but the popular consciousness was still saying, maybe we could reform it. Maybe we could just modify it. And so you would see grassroots campaigns taking up uh, the videos, what is it, body cameras, or you would see some of the other, uh, some other reform efforts which don't line up with our thinking um, as abolitionists. But now you have common folk, right, people, and what I mean by that is people who are not already in organization, people who are not already um, sort of already part of the ministry of abolition, so to speak, saying at their kitchen tables in their barber shops, wherever they are, like, look, we need to quit funding these motherfuckers. Like I'm talking, you know, but you know, so that so that I think is important, right? And you don't, and you tend to not see that sort of ideological shift across a country happen within such a short span of time. That's usually like a lifetime worth of like, you know, uh, uh, hegemony challenge and narrative power building and a bunch of other stuff. And this was all able to be achieved within four years. I think is also something that's um, really important. And the third thing is I'll just emphasize, which I built on before which is this is a moment where um, we're really employing an abolitionist framework, right? And so in a time where a lot of people are like, can we reform them? Can we shift them? Can we change? We're like, no, we abolitionists. And we're also doing so with the queer politic. And the, the reason why I'm emphasizing a queer politic in this moment inside of a black politic is it has to do with how you understand the world and what you imagine to be possible in the future. And because we're using a queer politic, we are challenging not only our relationship to the state, but how we are with each other. We are not also seeking to change and to shift power from electeds to us, but rather we are also renegotiating what does it mean for us to be in right relationship with each other, right relationship with the planet, right relationship and community, culture, and a host of other things that I think are central into what it means to really have a queer politic. So those things I think make this moment really ripe and a bit different than some other moments. Juicy, juicy, juicy. So I think we have about 30 minutes together left, although one of our leaders does have to jump off because she has another call um, that she's bumping up against. Um, and so want to pivot us to answering a couple of questions that are coming up in the chat. Um, and I feel like there's um, uh, a question that uh, might be helpful, Kayla, for you to answer before you go, this question around um, corporate Democrat support for white supremacy by suppressing, um, um, I, th I think we can think more broadly about like suppressing folks' right to vote, et cetera, and how we're thinking about responding to that um, through our electoral strategy. Yeah, so I mean, my, my, I appreciate that. So my, my first response is that white supremacy isn't uh, isolated to one political party in this country. That has never been true. And, and never will be true. Um, and we understand that um, in certain iterations of time over history, the coalitions that have pushed forth certain political parties uh, have shifted and have sacrificed um, intentionally the rights and, and, and visions and demands of Black voters. Uh, and we are, in a, a, we are in a very unique moment right now where there is a large movement um, that has changed conditions on a local level and that has not translated up ballot to produce a ticket um, for the, the main party where most of these people's votes have been for generations of, of time um, that align directly with that vision. They don't align with the vision to defund police. They don't align with the vision uh, to close jails. Um, they may not have come on as signers to the BREATHE Act and uh, I know as people on the left and as people with um, more radical, maybe some people don't consider themselves radical, more progressive viewpoints, 
that this is like at tension with the work that we are doing. Um, and, and what I will say is that, you know, every time I, I keep using this moment, I keep using the metaphor of, of a harvest. Um, even when some, some years you spend all summer, all spring long tilling the soil, you do not produce the harvest that you want to produce. That does not mean you give up on the ground. You continue to work it. And what we understand is that right now the soil has been deeply impacted by the current administration and that maybe by changing that we change a little bit of the conditions. Maybe the weather gets a little bit better. So they, we can spend more time tilling the soil for a better harvest. Uh, and we, we have to have a very you know, nuanced understanding of that, that the democratic establishment, the status quo establishment is not going to hand over power to movement. It's not going to hand over power to organizers. That does not mean we do not demand it and fight for it um, continually. And um, and I and I think that when this election we have to we have to do that we have to hold both of those truths, all of those truths, um, and continue to fight for what we know is real that we are defunding the police departments in major cities across the country. We are closing jails in major cities across the country. We are reallocating millions of dollars into our communities across uh, rural, suburban, and urban areas in this country. And we are winning uh, progressive seats and candidates who align with us are moving into the city halls, the state legislatures, and the congressional halls of our country. Uh, and if we keep tilling the soil, we will turn over a harvest that will one day produce something uh, that will be as transformative as we had envisioned. Um, but you know, this, this is one of those moments where we cannot be discouraged just understand that you know this is this is the work that lies before us, and so you know it is. It's definitely not one of those romantic moments. I but I, I definitely want us to hold that we are fighting against white supremacy, white supremacist in the Democratic Party, uh, white nationalism that has preserved a, a neoliberal politic um, that that postures as as liberal in some in some ways and postures as progressive in other ways but we'll continue to sacrifice our folks, but we must continue to organize um, and, and, and stay of that. And I have to go, and I'm really sorry that I have to go, but I love y'all. And uh, I believe deeply that we will win because we are winning um, and we were sent forth to do this work. And so I'm grateful to be in this work with you all. Thank you, Kayla, so much for sharing a little bit of your time and wisdom. You know, if you wanna learn more, follow Action St. Louis, follow her on her little, on her socials um, to keep getting that juicy wisdom from her. Um, so not, I see a uh, network, I see there's a couple of questions in here, just in terms of the app, when does it launch? What's its name? How do people download it? Should they send you money in the cash app for your brilliance around developing it? Any, 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 any of that, what you got for us network? Yeah, blessings. Um, I'm so glad that uh, everybody liked that little glimpse that we showed. So yes, you can definitely support us in the testing. We're just coming into the last phases of it. So it's pretty exciting to have you join. If you email m app at gmail.com, I'll drop it in the chat, then you'll be able to um, connect with us and join the testing team. We're looking to uh, be rolling this out over the summer fall, the, um, and so it will be soon. Um, and we will keep you updated and put you on an email list as well to get some updates on the progress. The name of it at the moment, um, it's a, the app for all black lives. Um, and we're rooting that inside our Black Power Rising strategy. But yeah, we um, are kind of in that mode at the moment of finding out what, what works with our youth, what works with people on the ground. So the name might change. If you have a good one, a don't one, let us know. Um, but yeah, so other than that, this summer, we're gonna be, um, like I say, putting this into the hands of people who are out on the streets. Like M mentioned, like their teams who are um, doing this work in schools, doing this work and winning to build that in to the app. So you can learn from people like in the dope work that's being done by Freedom Inc. But at the same time, you can also build your own campaign to get police out of schools and all of that. So, yeah. Beautiful. Thank you. Um, there's a question in the chat, uh, excuse me, in the question answer about thoughts on environmental racism, climate justice as racial justice, 
All I will say is we are coming up on the 15th anniversary of Hurricane Katrina. Be on the lookout. We will be dropping something um, that speaks directly to that question, but I don't want to give any, uh, what's that word when you tell too much of the movie before people, other people didn't see the movie? Spoilers. That's right. Don't want to give no spoilers, but be on the lookout for that. Um, there's a question in here around, should we be talking about the defund movement as restructuring versus defunding? Um, because this person is identifying that conservatives are using the frame of defund to incite fear uh, amongst certain demographics. What say y'all, team? Yeah, I mean, so I think, you know, with any framework, it lends itself to co-optation or it lends itself to be used against you if you're not clear about the ideological underpinnings. So a framework is just a way to talk about something, a way to talk through a strategy, an apparatus for people to understand a concept. It by itself does not say what you think the world should be like. So you could say you're going to defund the police and, be, and, you know, and then have private security and boo, we're against that, right? Um, and so I'm bringing that up to say what we're really trying to do is communicate to people and to anchor this framework inside of an abolitionist politic. So the movement for Black Lives, we have three ideological underpinnings. We're abolitionists, which means sort of on the face of it, we don't believe we should be using po police, prisons, or jails to solve any of our social issues. Two, we're anti-capitalist. We, we know our liberation cannot come inside of an exploitive uh, economic system, period, any form of it. Um, and three, we're black queer feminists. So when we talk about defund, what we're, what we're identifying and what we're offering is that this is an important strategy to get us to abolition. And why I think defund is so smart and why I think we should talk about it and, and really connect back to defund or, or to use that explicit framework is because we're inside of a time in the economy where the government's going to employ austerity measures, right? And austerity meaning that the government is saying there's not enough money in the economy, not enough resources. And as a result, they got to cut spending, cut the budgets. And what we know as black folks and what we know as left, leftists is that the, where, the, where they get cut is in programs that our folks actually need. Right. So when it happens in school systems, they cut arts, um, you know, extracurricular, health and recreation, like they cut all of that stuff. When it happens on a city scale and national scale, it cuts to education, cuts to social services, cuts to departments of um, health and human needs, cuts to housing, et cetera. We're inside one of those moments. We're already, right, the government has been saying on all different levels, local to national, the government has been saying there's not enough resources. What are we going to do? Right. And we, and we are, many of us are clocking what's happening around housing and, you know, the ending of uh, moratoriums on evictions and just, you know, paying attention to how are we going to protect our folks when mass evictions come out. I'm saying that to say what we know historically and what we know currently is inside of these particular economic moments. The response of the government is to cut spending in our communities and fund and increase funding to policing systems. Right. So at the same time where you're worried about, damn, am I going to be able to pay my rent next month? Um, the police are getting a raise. At the same time where we didn't have enough hospitals and enough medical care to deal with COVID, the goddamn military's got 900 million tanks and increasing. Right. At the same time when we're unsure about, um, you know, the food systems or how to protect workers or um, how to make sure, you know, people who are parenting at home can have an adequate child care system structure situation, right? Trump and the military talking about outer space, you know, whatever. So you get what I'm saying, right? Is that these things go hand in hand. And part of why I think it's important to say defund is because, right, when you take money and resource and capacity, right, out of one place, you put it somewhere else. And what they're doing is they're steady blighting our communities, our resources, and they're putting it into policing, military, prisons, ICE. And so we need to say it directly. We ain't going with these old historic austerity patterns. We ain't with that. We in COVID, we got a movement, God damn it. 
We're going to take this money and we need to be explicit about it. We're going to take these, this money and not only are we going to take this money, we're also going to take back our intellectual capacities. We're going to take back our human life. We're going to take all of our shit back that was invested. We're going to go into prisons. We're going to get our people out. We're going to free our folks from jails and we're going to snatch these badges off of these fucking police chests. And we're going to put them back inside of our community, inside of our politics. So that is where the restructuring is. But I think as a movement, we have to be willing to be bold and name it, defund. And no matter how you talk about your issue as a leftist and as a person who believes in a different world, they are always going to speak against you. They are always going to come against you, right? And so that can't just be the metric of how we talk about our issues. So I think it's important to be explicit about defunding as an important strategy to get us to that vision. So I, I'm like, use it. Yeah, and I would argue that sometimes that's a metric that shows that our shit is working, right? When when we know when when Trump is talking about defund, we know that we're pressing buttons and we're moving things in ways that um, haven't been moved before. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Yes, you went off, 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 off. Okay, so there's um, some questions in here, and Ash, um, as a leader in the rising majority. Um, which is our cross-sectorial multiracial experiment space. Uh, I'm hoping that you can answer um, this question really around, um, so someone just named like, I absolutely love the connections that I'm seeing between the BREATHE Act and, and other movements, i.e. the carceral state immigration detention. Um, and so there's a question on um, how is intersectionality and cross movement organizing? Like, can we speak to the criticalness that that plays in building powerful progressive movements? And then I think similarly, um, there's another question um, that that also is asking, uh, yeah, to speak to those linkages, um, specifically around defund the police work, defunding the military, et cetera. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think both, and for BL and the rising majority spaces are cross-sectoral, right? They're multi-sectoral. There are people that are doing all different kinds of work and along all different kinds of front lines or issue areas of work. And they're, they're multi-tactical, right? We have organizations that prioritize base building and organizing and direct action. There's advocates and policy wonks, right? There's, it's a big mix. And that's true tactically and strategically within and for BL. It's definitely true for the rising majority, which is our like multiracial cross-sector project. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think it's critical to the, su the success of the work, right? I hear our comrade Maurice Mitchell in my head saying, this is an all hands, no sharp elbows moment, uh, where for us to really be able to topple authoritarianism and fascism, it's gonna take us coming together uh, to figure out how we can work together at the intersection of our of our similarities and our, our shared desire to not have another you know decade of foolishness uh, in which our people are losing their lives and losing more and more access to the power that they deserve to have to self-determine and self-govern themselves. So I think that InfraBL was birthed into uh, a politic of intersectionality, right? We're Black queer feminists, we're folks that are coming from multi different, like multiple different class backgrounds and uh, national identities and the like uh, to come together again to do together what we couldn't do, make possible separately. I think to the point of, of like, some of it, some of the intersectionality stuff is, is twofold. There's an internal politic and value, right? When we say all black lives matter, we mean all black lives, right? And so we have an intersectional politic and are building an intersectional practice, right? Which is, is not a given. A lot of people are preaching the politics of black queer feminism, of believing in disability justice, of doing all these things and aren't doing a damn thing to hold themselves accountable and assess that they're doing it. And for BL is constantly trying to figure out how we can continue to embed our values and our practice together. Uh, but there's also this external facing practice of intersectionality uh, uh, that, that is around this defund demand. And I think M was speaking about it earlier, right? When we say defund the police, we mean all cops. We mean cops that are, you know, a part of your, your municipal police department. We mean cops in schools. Shout out to my comrades in Madison who just got that contract broke. Uh, you know, shout out to the folks that are that like about face and others that are members of the rising majority who've been fighting back uh, against militarism and how it's showing up not only in our country and in the streets in response to our protests, uh, but also how it's showing up in countries where other black and brown people live, right? Uh, so InfraBL is trying to build that, that intersectional politic and make sure that it's reflected in our work. 
And a couple of ways that we're doing that is the rising majority and the work that's been coming out of that. There's some really sexy stuff that's coming. Uh, but like, like Carissa said, I also don't want to be a spoiler. So I'm gonna let her say what we can say. Um, but I would also then say that like in, internally to InfraBL, right, you can see in the vision for Black Lives, right? We've said what we believe, right? That preamble is very, very clear about our politics around policing being more than just municipal cops, um, including defunding uh, you know, militarism and making sure that, uh, that money that is going into the budgets of other countries to, to harm people through military force actually come back and be invested in our communities. We've said that, we said that in 2016, y'all. We said that in 2016, when people said that young black people were just angry in the streets and didn't have a vision, we dropped that vision for black lives to talk very specifically about our demands in regards to, to the intersectional issues that we were facing every day. We do not live single identity lives and the vision for black lives and the Breathe Act and the rising majority's work and the Black Power Rising Plan, I think are articulations of our intersectional politic and practice. You on mute, Carissa. We can't hear you, babe. You look great though. Oh, I was I was I was naming that I just started smiling real hard because I just got a text from one of my comrades who lives in a Freedom Summer City to let me know that one of our Freedom Summer fellows just knocked on their door to give them this good word about about black liberation. So we're out here knocking on doors, talking to our people, socially distancing, knocking on the door and walking six feet away. Um so uh, I appreciate everybody who's dropped questions. Um, unfortunately, we're not going to be able to get to them all, um, but there's lots of ways that you can continue to stay updated. But I did want to throw one more question, and I'm hoping that each panelist can take just a second to answer it, um, which is um, when folks get off this call, if they only did one thing in service of our collective liberation, what would it be? And whoever's ready to jump in, if y'all need to take a second to think about it, because it's a big question. But whenever you're ready, to jump in. Jasmine, I know you see us all looking. At you. <laughs> okay. Um, I would say one thing when, we, when you get off this call, what to do um, is find your organization. Find an organization in your hometown, get with them, tell them about the defund movement that is going on. Start doing grassroots organization, organizing. Um, also vote, 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 vote. Um, that's another way that we hold our power um, and tell your community about voting and, and how powerful it is and research your um, candidates and put pressures on whoever is elected. That's, that's my take, take away. Thank you, Boo. Thank you. Uh, who wants to jump in? Yeah, I'd uh, just ask everybody to go to m4bl.org and um, look through our website. Um, it's more than a website. It has so much of our political ideology, our political education, our strategy, being able to see the work that's happening across the, the locals, across the US. So it's really important to get to know the content. Um, also, I'd ask you all to look at the virtual events that we have. Um, and we have the next one coming up on the 19th of August, which will be looking at ending the war on black trans GNC and intersex communities. So that will be a really dope panel and really um, interesting for you to like sign up and join that and see what's happening with that work. And then just keep uh, connected, sign up, join the movement and you'll find out about all these things. Um, text 909, what is it? Seven five, uh, the number in order to get text updates on your phone. And if you're interested in the app, then reach out to M4BL app at Gmail and we'll get you, um, yeah, woven into the testing and the launch. Beautiful. Thank you, network.
Which who who gonna jump in next? Am you ready? I I'm a firm believer in people entering movement from where they are. So I'm not like there isn't a single issue. What I can do is name several, and then you situate your si yourself inside of it. So one of the most powerful ones is what Jasmine named, right? And what Ash points out is we really are seeking to do together what we cannot do alone. And at a local level, that means joining an organization, right? I mean, you get to experience being engaged with me, but I'm the result of several years of being in an organization, being sharpened by other people, learning, trying out things, bumping my head, being course corrected, being held accountable, shifting, coming back, right? And so joining an organization is so important because we are in this for the collective, right? And so don't none of us is gonna save it by ourselves, no matter how brilliant, smart, sexy, et cetera, we are, join up in an organization. If you are in a place where there is not an organization for you to join or one that doesn't fit into your life, hook up with a couple friends. Y'all, we're going we gonna to go to these social medias and watch these recommended movies. We're going to download these toolkits and the actions we've been putting out inside of COVID. We give some at different levels, some that you can just do by yourself at home, ranging to being in the streets and on the front lines, right? And so doing some of those things with your friends, with your families, with your boot thing, with a homie on social media, right? Sharing the message. We named a thing for you to come to August 28th, right? And, and I'm saying this because it's important because many of us are caregivers, may, may ourselves have um, limited capacity, um, may not be able to do a whole different, a whole bunch of different things, but there is a wider range of things that we're offering for people to be inside of the movement. And if you cannot place yourself inside of an action, one of the most important, more, one of the most important things you can do is believe, right? We need people on the ground, in families, in communities who got the back of the movement because they see themselves as part of the movement, right? Don't do it for me. It's great if you love me. I love me. Hey. Love me too, right? But do it for you, right? So being able to believe in this and being able to say this is a part of me, I think goes so long because the people, the movement is made up of people and we need you to be one of the people um, inside of the movement. And the last thing, and this is why I'm like, I like to tell everybody this. You know what? If you got a grievance or a gripe, call your mayor. That's something you can do. If you mad about why it ain't no money for this, what you gonna do for your kids in school, da, 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 join the fight and holding these fools accountable, right? If you wanna know what's gonna happen to the schools, call the police chief. He got all the money, they got all the money. Ask the motherfuckers what they gonna do for your kid, right? So, you know, there's all different ways to be involved. And, I, and one of the things we really wanna do is encourage people to use their voice at this time, whether it's like you calling the mayor yourself because you got something to say, shoot that email, hashtag, troll, troll, Trump on Twitter, all of that, do that, right? And also believe at home, be part, and join organization if you can. Crystal, what would you tell them to do? We can't hear you, babe. I, I was about to enter because you know Ash likes to take us home, um, so I'm 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 I'm, I'm gonna let you uh, take us on home. So, so one of our comrades um, and leaders in the Movement for Black Lives uh, wrote a mandate for Black people, um, and it is uh, both feels like a demand and an invitation, a prayer. Uh, it's sacred. We uh, use it to guide us. Um, and so I'm not going to share the whole mandate with y'all because um, I don't know who on this call, because it is a mandate for Black people. But I do believe that there's a key portion of that mandate that we actually all need to be inside of, um, and that's being willing to be transformed in the service of the work. And so th that's that's my request, that, that folks leave this call looking for uh, and being willing to be inside of opportunities that transform you, transform how you understand this world, transform what you think is politically p possible, um, and build build um, connections, communities, um, and 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 uh, yeah, strategies that get us closer to our north star. What's left to say after after all of these brilliant fucking people <laughs> just just laid out like some really concrete steps for folks to take? I would say to wrap it up that the doors of the movement are wide open for you to join. Right. I would ask you a question of what is around where you are? Are you near one of the 150 organizations that make up the movement for black lives, the thousands that are ready and able and willing to join our movement? Are you interested and ready? Are you 
calling in for BL them? Or are you seeing in for BL, especially for those of you that are black, as you, you, the movement for black lives? Have you gone to the website and joined? Have you joined one of the organizations that make up our ecosystem? We are so excited about being in relationship with you and the people that you care about. So come on in, the doors of the movement are open, right? If you've ever chanted, I believe that we will win or ain't no power like the power of the people because the power of the people don't stop. You've made a declaration of faith that you believe in the values of the movement for black lives. We want you to come on and make it so, come on in. You can go and you can, it literally says, join the movement on our website. Come on in. There's so much work for us to do. There's so many things that you and your skills will make possible, will, add, will be value added to our work, right? So come on, come on in. The, the last thing that I would tell you is, is exactly what M. Adams said. We need some evangelists for the movement for Black Lives. I need people that all over the country can have the, the conversation in the, in, in the line to go vote in November and say, yeah, like I'm voting because I care about the movement for black lives. I'm voting in defense of black lives. I'm an M for BL voter. When you are on social media and you're like trolling all of the people that get on your nerves, I need you to be like, I'm trolling you because I value black lives and I need y'all to like quit talking shit about defund and start to reimagine what public safety can look like. I just need you to see yourself as being an active person that's involved in our movement, whether you are a black person that can come on into the family or you are an ally and co-conspirator that can say, you know what, them people over there is talking real stuff. Y'all need to be paying attention to what they're doing. If you are a part of a multiracial organiza multi organization and you are not a black person, but you wanna be down with them for BL, we need you to join the rising majority, right? Don't just talk about being an ally with the for BL, come and practice being one, right? And then be on the lookout for the incredible the incredible, the exciting, the revolutionary opportunities that are coming because we're not gonna quit until we've won y'all. And for BL is not going anywhere anytime soon. Uh, so come on and get down with us. Um, I see the homies in the chat are asking for a chant. I wanna see if any of y'all got a good one uh, and we'll close this thing on down. Y'all gonna make me do it? Of course. Lord Jesus. Well, it feels like we're we're talking about defund. Shouldn't we do a defund chant? What you got, Kay? Jasmine, you got a chant for us, boo? Come on, Jasmine. <laughs> all right, we just got, listen, I think that the best one to do in the context of all this good, good that you just heard, I want to do two things. One is I want to see if y'all are making a commitment in the chat. Like, are y'all going to actually, because I'm down to give a chant, but I don't, I don't like, you know, being in transactional relationships. I want a transformative one. So I'm down to lead a chant if you tell me what you're gonna do to throw down for the movement for Black Lives in the chat. If you could give me one thing that you're gonna do to amplify and support the leadership of the movement for Black Lives, whether it's joining, going to the website, signing up for the Breathe Act, checking out the Freedom Summer page, whatever it is, if you could give me a couple of things that you're gonna do, then I'll give you a chant. I'll chant it out. All right, I see Savannah said, they're gonna sign up their friends and family as community co-sponsors of the Breathe Act. I see a bunch of Breathe Acts, yes. Gonna to go to the website, find an org near you. Shout out to Carissa Lewis, who you also should be in touch with if you're trying to find an org. Definitely joining an organization, educating your friends and family, volunteering, sharing the links, yes. Following all these brilliant people on their social media, getting your friends on board. Whoa, somebody just joined Freedom Inc. <laughs> That's lit. <laughs> That's lit. They got some of the best propaganda in the game. Word. All right, Raleigh, North Carolina. I see, I see the other Southerners. This is great. Okay. All right. Sharing the email for the app testing team. Yo, the app is lit. You want to do that. Okay. I see a bunch of this beautiful stuff. So, okay. I think you've earned, I think you've earned your chant. Uh, this one actually comes from our comrades uh, in BYP 100. They've got a really dope uh, uh, what is it, a mixtape, I guess, for lack of a better, they got a really dope album called The Black Joy Experience. I encourage all of you who identify as Black people to go on any streaming service and get it. Um, and y'all just gonna, gonna repeat after me, beloveds. Um, so comrades, I know that the, the, the sound will be off. 
but for those of you that are willing and able to join me in responding to this call and response, feel free. It'll be messy. It's okay. It's a safe space. For those of you that can't come off mute, uh, I, I want you to just, you know, live your best background singer life. At least look excited to do it for these comrades that are in the chat, looking at your beautiful faces. <laughs> uh, we're just going to do some I believe that we will win. You ready? And, and, and for those of you that we cannot see, the like still hundreds some odd people that are on the call, like y'all go in too. Like we want to be able to feel it because some, somehow or another as a cultural organizer, I believe that the sound waves that we're putting out will bump into each other and will make some impossible shit possible. It might be the little bump that I needed in my day to keep doing this revolutionary work when, I, when my sound waves bump up against yours somewhere out here in the world, right? We can be physically distant and socially in solidarity with each other. So we're gonna practice that right now. Here we go. Y'all ready comrades? Oh, I don't believe you. And if I don't believe you, then certainly these hundred people won't believe you. Are y'all ready to chant? I'm ready. All right, here we go. I, 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 see, believe. I believe that we, I believe, I believe, that, I believe we that we, I believe that we will win. Yeah. Let's get free. We love y'all. There's also a request for us to drop our social media in the chat. If you and we can do that. And uh, if you go to the link on the Netroots page. You can see all of our bios and our websites and our socials, but uh, we will we will share them in the chat as well. Thank you so much for everybody who took 90 minutes out of your day to spend time with us. And we look forward to continuing to be in touch and in a righteous community together. Ooh.